Today we're going to discuss the uh, page 36, Daf Lamed Vav, which actually the second part is a new chapter, um, chapter 3, Kira. The first part of the Shur of the Daf, we're going to uh, complete our discussion over uh, Mukze. We're going to uh, elaborate the difference between uh, carrying shofar and carrying a harp or chatzotzra. Then in Mitzvah we'll go to the second part, which is a new chapter dealing with a, a, a Hilchot Hatmana Vehashaya, which means a lot of halachot in regard to pull out from our uh, stove or blech or pl- uh, Shabbat uh, uh, plata back and forth um, uh, before Shabbat or um, putting back before Shabbat or putting back during Shabbat different food. Uh, that was fully cooked in advance. We have three lines from the top of the page uh, 36. Ela Lokashia. Before we study, it seems we, uh, we have a special Torah portion of this week, Chayei Sarah, the life of Sarah. And the Torah used the term Chayei twice, one in Chayei Sarah and one Vaychi Yaakov, the life of Yaakov. And it's a famous question rabbis ask, how come they use the term life while they're speaking about the death? These two are portions are dealing with the death of Sarah, and then the last portion of the Rishi, the Genesis, ended by the, the end of life of Yaakov, of Jacob. And again, they use the word Vaichi. And the rabbis elaborate and they say that the real life begins after life, which is the real life of the Neshama, of the soul, begins of after life. When we really live in this world, we live in this world when we study Torah. That's the time that the soul nourishes and live, and that's considering a time. It's a famous midrash. They, they tell us about a great rabbi that was in search of a city for retirement, and he traveled from city to city. One upon a time, he entered a place that um, uh, they have a large cemetery at the entrance of the city. So he stopped by the cemetery and noticed something very weird. They said that people are buried there, and they said that person lived for three years, that person lived for three months, another person lived for two years, and the oldest person for the entire city was like eight years old when he died. So uh, he went to the city and he uh, asked people, what's going on? I saw the cemetery and it's uh, like everybody uh, die young while I see here elderly people around. So they said, oh, go to the Hebra Kadisha, the people who are in charge for the a, a burial, and ask them. They all laugh. They, he went to the Hebra Kadisha and they tell him, here we have a different rules. When a person is born, we have a big book, and he needs to fill up the minutes and the second and the time that he really have a life, meaning the life that he really fulfill himself by study Torah. And then when he is passed, we have a committee, and they count the minutes and the time, and then we evaluate how long he really lived in this world. So the oldest person in our city, the biggest rabbi and scholar, he lived about eight years of real life. So here, my dear friends, we're about to live in a real life by study this daf, which is three lines from the top of the page 36. Ela Lokashia, Harabi Yuda, Harabi Shimon. Here we have a discussion over a mukze. As we said in the previous daf, that the person... Um, used to uh, have, um, the community used to have a Chazana Knesset, a fellow that represent the community who blow the shofar six times on Friday to announce that the Shabbat is coming. And because of that, uh, uh, people have a certain level of preparations when they hear the first blast, the second, the third, etc. Then we ask a question, where, what do you do with the shofar? He needs a time to bring it back. And we explain that he has a special occasion on the top of the roof that he is basically putting the shofar because we're not supposed to carry it. Then it was an opinion that the shofar is different than chatzotzra, than a harp, because chatzotzra is sometimes also used, but you cannot carry it on Shabbat, while the shofar, there are some who hold that since in ancient time you can use this, the, the way that the shofar is bended to uh, bring the water to baby, so that's a certain way you can uh, use the shofar and carry it. So now we ask a question that it's basically a contradiction. It's a contradiction between three brighter that said a different uh, opinion. So they said, Ha Rabbi Yehuda, Ha Rabbi Shimon, Ha Rabbi Nehemiah, which means 
the first, the, the second writer that hold that you allowed to carry shofar, but you cannot carry chatzotzra, a harp. It's according to Rabbi Yudha that he's a streaker when it's come to a law of mukze. Um, as you know, we mentioned yesterday that Rabbi Yudha and um, Rabbi Shimon has a different opinion in regard to mukze. Um, usually Rabbi Shimon is much lenient, um, and Rabbi Yudha is much streaker, but here, um, he, um, it's a situation that um, Rabbi Nehemia is uh, disagree with them, um, and and um, in both, and in much stricter uh, more than both of them. So uh, he, in general, Rabbi Yuda, who was a stricter in the law of Mukze, he allowed to carry shofar on Shabbat because he hold that since the shofar has another use, not only to tell people that Shabbat is coming, but also to do what to prepare the food mm -hmm. for the baby, which means right. to give the baby water, mm -hmm. because they use the shofar like a shovel mm -hmm. to bring the, ba the baby the water and give him something to drink, which is allow on Shabbat. The Magen of Ram in uh, Shinchet said that he's allow on Shabbat. So he forbade, however, to carry chatzotzra, to carry a, a trumpet, a harp on Shabbat, because there's no use for that um, a trumpet on Shabbat. So it's considering Kli Shemelachto Isu, which is a vessel that you use for something that is prohibited. And therefore, uh, uh, Rabbi Nehemiah is tricky. Ha Rabbi Shimon, that Rabbi Shimon is much lenient in Mukze, and he holds that even a trumpet, that it's Kli Shemelachto Isu, he also allow it, however, to uh, carry on Shabbat. Tosfot, by the way, disagree with that. Harabi Nehemia, the first brighter that forbade both, uh, it's according to Rabbi Nehemia, so that he hold that uh, only a clean nital letzorech tashmisho, that you can carry a vessel only for its purpose. So, for example, you can, he hold that you cannot even carry a knife only if you need it to, for example, to cut a string or to do something um, um, for the purpose of something related to the Shabbat need. Why? Because if the, the, the knife, you need the knife to cut food and not to cut string, so therefore Rabbi Nehemia in our case forbids even to carry the shofar because he said the purpose of shofar is to do what? Is to, to warn about the Shabbat. The Shabbat. Well, uh, on the Shabbat, excellent. So therefore, the main purpose of the Shofar, Bin Nehemiah hold, is only to do tekiah shofar. Mm -hmm. And not to serve as a baby um, uh, needs some water to drink. So that's, uh, that's uh, the difference, and that's the idea of Rabbi Nehemiah, that he forbids it. By the way, all of that is the Shitat Rashi. That's the way that Rashi takes this statement. Tosfot, it's very different. The abbreviation of Tosfot, he holds that um, it's all depend upon the big machloket between Rabbi Huda and Rabbanan. Meaning, Tosfot holds that even Shofar itself it's considering a kli shemelachto isu that it's a vessel that you needed for something that is forbidden on Shabbat, and therefore, because they, it's, lo, it's allocated to something that it's called tashmisha asu, something that is forbidden to do, some type of work on Shabbat, and therefore, according to Svod, that's the big machloket between Rabbi Shimon and Rabbi Yehuda, which is, Rabbi Shimon allowed to carry the shofar and trumpet because it's, um, um, he holds a statement that any a vessel, any cliche melachtoli, so any vessels that they have a use for something that's forbidden, yet you tell you can carry it in order to do something that it's called tashmish hamutar b'shabbat, that you can use it for some purpose that he allow on Shabbat, such as, by Alachai it's called Letzorech Gufo, or Letzorech Mekomo, for the purpose of doing something that he allow on Shabbat, 
for example, um, to uh, move items in order to um, use it, or, um, um, uh, for example, if you want to save that from, uh, from damage, or from people who may steal it, etc. So that's the, the, the Rabbi Shimon opinion. Rabbi Yuda hold that, um, that you can carry the shofar letzorech gufo, letzorech mekomo, the same as Rabbi Shimon, however, he forbids carrying a trumpet at all, under no circumstance. Why? Because Rabbi Yuda says something that makes sense. He said, look, what do you need a trumpet on Shabbat? What do you need it for? You have no needs. So, you cannot uh, uh, pull out the water and serve the baby. You cannot do anything with, with a trumpet. It's, it's a trumpet, right? So, in that sense, he said that the owner of the trumpet made it like a mukze, made it, uh, it designated the trumpet before Shabbat um, a, a solely and only to, to, to um, play the trumpet. So therefore, he's uh, considering it as a total mukze. The Rashba hold clearly that that's the difference between Rabbi Shimon and Rabbi Yudah. So here, we understand that all of these three brightot hold each of them for different one. One according to Rabbi Yuda, one according to Rabbi Shimon, and one according to Rabbi Nehemiah that forbids in any form or shape all the options he said that it's forbidden. So now, since we said that, that, um, that the trumpet is forbidden, and shofar in some circumstances also forbidden, the Gemara asks a question, Umay shofar namei chatzotzrot. When we want to explain the slight difference um, uh, between the shofar and chatzosrot, what does that mean? Shofar, when Rabbi Nehemiah used the term shofar, he meant to say trumpet, which means uh, that when they use the, 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 the term trumpet, it meant to say shofar. What does that mean? So there is a concept Rashi said that it's called lo zu af zu ktane. When you said one, you meant to say also others. So for example, if you use the term chatzotzra, trumpet, you mean to say that it's also shofar. Why? Because if you look at the way it's built inside and you hear the sound, even the sound is a little different, but the process of making the sound, it's basically the same process. Uh, and therefore, um, uh, in his language, he used the word chatzotzra, trumpet. He meant to say shofar too, and he included by that the shofar, and therefore it's forbidden. Kid Rav Chizda. Let's go by the Rav Chizda. The Amar Rav Chizda. Rav Chizda says, "Hanei tlat milei ishtanei shmaihu miki charav beit hamidrash." So the Chatam Sofer explained to us. The reason that we use the trumpet and include the shofar, because in the time that the temple was in existence, they had a certain designation for each item, such as when they won the war, they used the trumpet, right? When they need to blow the shofar, it wasn't just in our days for Rosh Hashanah. It was for many different locations and, and the events, they used the shofar, and it was a very different designation of each uh, one of them. Since all these three things, when the Beit HaMikdash, when the Holy Temple destroyed, and now the use of the trumpet and shofar different, very different, therefore people unfortunately mix up the two, which is whatever earlier they call Chatzotzarta, which means like chatzotzra, like trumpet, now after the destruction of the Beit HaMikdash, of the temple, shofar, they call it shofar. And what is called early before the destruction of the temple, shofar, now all of a sudden they call it chatzotzra, they call it a trumpet. So they ask, lemay nafka amina. So why, why, we need to tell us, why you need to tell us that they change the names of the trumpet and the shofar? So they said the answer is Le shofar shel Rosh Hashanah 
as you know, in Rosh Hashanah, there is an obligation to use a shofar that made out of a ram. So, for example, shofar that made out of silver, such as, if you look at the picture of the Beit HaMikdash, you remember we see the large picture at the entrance of the Beit HaMikdash that Machon HaMikdash made? So you see these large trumpets in the picture, right? So in this big picture, you see the way that they used to do it in the Beit HaMikdash. What did they do? They used a special trumpet that made out of silver. It's called Shofar Shel Kesef. It was basically trumpet that made out of silver. They used the term Shofar that made out of silver. So, um, so the Rambam in Hilchot Shofar, he discussed this type of situation. Um, because there is a specific requirement for shofar to be kosher, um, um, uh, and and because uh, people who are not educated, like Amea Aretz, so those people who are not educated, they mix between a ram, a, a shofar that made out of ram, and a trumpet, and they ask, oh, what should I blow in Rosh Hashanah? And in those days they tell them Chatzotzra, trumpet. And they hear Chatzotzra, they, they mix the two. So therefore, in a time of the Talmud, they use a shofar that, um, that, that people in those days call it Chatzotzra and not something that they call shofar, which is different. That again is a Talmudic time. That's the difference. Another different what it's called doing the time of the temple Arava which means willow what they call willow at the time of Beit HaMikdash now they change the name they call it instead Tzaftzafa 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 so um, one of the books here explain that the, the Tzaftzafa it's like a um, it's a different shape of leaves. Uh, branches from the willow are used for the palm branch on the festival of Sukkot. But the, the other one, it's Tzaftzafa, they don't use it. So sometimes you see willows that they are not kosher for the Abad, I meaning for the four species, if it's not a real willows, like they made it in a way that it's, there are two and two and two and it's no in between um, anything. Tzaftzafa, it's a little, it's a willow branch with a, a pointed leaves. Um, they, they use the word, uh, Latin word of boys or salex, something like old um, um, willows. But anyway, since the, the Gemara in, in Sukkah said in um, 34, that in the time of the Beit HaMikdash, what it's called Arava, what it's called willow, now they use the term tzaftzafa. And now, um, uh, and that word, um, the mix up between Arava and tzaftzafa, the early time and now time. Um, Arava, the willow, the top, it's usually a red, and, and they have a long leaf and clear one. Tzaftzafa, the top is white, and, and it's absolutely a, a a, a, like a circle and it's look like a magal you know like a, a, the one that used for the omers it's very different Lemay Nafkamina why we need to know the difference between Arava and Tzaftzafa the answer is Lelulav meaning that if you take the four species for the Lulav the Arba Taminim you have Lulav and Trog Adas Arava the Martels the Willows the Etrog and the, the, the Lulav the one made of palm tree so if you take something that it's Tzaftzafa that it's not real Willow then you did not fulfill the Mitzvah you have to have the Arba Taminim the whole four species made in a way that they are all are kosher so Rav Chizda concluded and he said Torah, what they used to call at the, at the uh, time of the Beit HaMikdash a large table that was originally called Patora in the later generation Ptorta the same opposite Ptorta is Patora 
So, so what's the what's the difference? Lemain af kamina. Difference is lemika chumim kar to buy and sell, which means a person who order a petora should know that he order a small table and not a large one. Because again, they mixing between the two. Amar abaye, af anu nomar. We also use a word that can have a different uh, meaning when you talk about the um, the kashrut. There are certain uh, part of the animals. Well, I don't know if you recall when we study chulin. When we speak about animals, hechsher uh, animals. So sometimes you have an issue that the intestine have some holes, and then it may turn to be treifa, which means something that is forbidden to eat. So he said sometimes the the in the past they use the term huvlila. Beikasei. They use the term of Lila, the first stomach of animals that chew the cud. In recent generation, it's called a, a Beikasei. And whatever it's, uh, the, the, what is called in the past Beikasei, it's called now Huv uh, Lila. So, again, when you're speaking about uh, animals that are Ma'alei Gera, Malay gera meaning that uh, animals that chew the cud. So what happened is a, a um, wounded that is uh, um, animal that is wounded is basically trifa. It's not kosher to use. But uh, the um, the Talmudic time, those who slaughtered animals were not professionals. So as a result, they will often pose questions to the, to the rabbis. So here the Gemara wants to emphasize the, the familiarity of the animal's body and what's the, the point of halacha. So they said, and just I'm digressing for a second to make it clear, inside the intestine of the animals there are four stages. Um, it's go from the mouth to the stomach and then the, the food it start um, uh, breaking to pieces and 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 turn to be a almost like a liquid. Then it go to a place called beta kosot, which is the second stage, and and then they go to the the end of their um, uh, stomach, and and because it was the two pieces that hold together with the fat inside the animals. Um, uh, it's a process. Now by animals it's called ma'alei gera because the, the food coming back to their mouth um, um, and they chew it again and then they chew it again and then they chew it, chew it, chew until it's very very small pieces and then they, they put it back. So only after the animals ma'alei gera that they chew it the second time then and only then the, this is the time that their food can go back inside their intestine and 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 go to their uh, real uh, pr final process of uh, a digestion and get in so this process of hemses to make it um, to change the status of the food from the first stage to the second one it's called hemses or huvlila that's uh, and and then they mix up between beikas and huvlila between the two Anyway, lemain af kamina. Why we have this discussion? So they said lemachat shenimtzet beovi beit akosot. They slaughter animal, and then people who are not so familiar, they taking the body of the animals. I mean the part that it's a question and bring it before the rabbis. They open, and they see a needle inside the place that it's called beit akosot, like a place that looks like a glasses inside the the belly of the animal so if you see a little a needle so it's a question why the mitzah dechad kshera umishnei tzdadim treifa which means in the first stomach even the needle per penetrate only one side of the wall the animal assumes the halachic status of treifa. What is treifa? Okay. Nevela, meaning dead animal. 
animal is dead, you cannot do anything. If somebody shot an animal, and you come there and you slaughter it, according to halacha, it's not kosher, because the animal was nevela, was dead. There is a different situation that is not kosher, when the animal slaughtered properly, however, while you finalize the process and you open the stomach, you realize inside that, for example, the intestine has a hole. So that's considering treif or treifa in Hebrew, and you cannot use it. So here is a crucial to distinguish between the first and the second stomachs. We explained that it's a process of digestion. Why? The im mitzadechad kshira. If the needle came in in one side, it's okay. Umishnei tzadim. If the needle is in a both side, so it's trifa, and therefore you cannot use it. So that's the difference. When you see the, the difference between one side and two sides, uh, it's a it's a it's called huvlila. Meaning, if you have an animals that they have this blemish. And because of this blemish, you can, um, 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 sh- sh- the animals cannot live any longer. That's called treifa, which means you cannot, um, let's say if you are a vet. My previous chavruta, Dr. Weisberg, we study almost eight years. He is a vet for 28 years. So he has an animal hospital. So many times the people from Star K, Rabbi Heinemann and others, used to ask him those type of questions when it's come to animals' body. I remember we, we used to study, and uh, people from Star K, Rabbi Heinemann and a few others used constantly to ask him those type of questions. What, which is, you have a situation that the animal is brought before the vet, and the vet realizes that the animal carry a mum, a blemish, inside the animal. And the minute the vet recognizes it, is a trafe, which means even you go ahead and you slaughter the animal properly, it's still trafe. It's still trafe. So one of the things that make the animals non-kosher, it's called nekev bahemses, which means if you see a hole in the intestine or a place called beta koso, the gmoin chulin, in, um, in Membet, in 42, described, since we said that it's like a, inside the intestine, it's like, look like a cups <coughs> inside there, that basically th- take the food and digest it before it go back to their, to, to, to chew it in their, in their stomach, in their, in their, um, you know, mouth again, second time. So that's called beta kosot, the place that you have those, those, um, those quote-unquote cups, okay? So if there is a hole there, it's a big question how, what's the size, how big, how long is it. But if you see it, a, a hole that, for example, you have a needle there, but they have the hole, it's a question, what do you do? Um, um, trace a situation that you have the beta kosot, these cups filled of fat, and this needle is go just by one side, and does not penetrate in the level that it's hit the other side, the needle stuck in the fat. So it's a question if you make that animal a trafe or not. So um, basic halakha is only when you see the needle coming out in both sides of the, the beta kosot, which means it's called in the Hebrew language nekev mefulash, which means that the, the hole is coming from the intestine the internal part of the of the beta kosot and it's go out to the other side however if you see the hole only in one side the animal is not considering a trafe why because the second part it's close the hole and therefore um, uh, it, it's not considering a, a locking that par- uh, part but uh, therefore, we, we, we see here a crucial difference when you call something, uh, use the term um, um, uh, here, hemses, or use the term um, beikase, or huvlila. You see now, when people mix between the two, it's a problem. The best is when they bring the animals to, the, to us and you can see it. 
But if you just depend on people, which cannot uh, make your halachic ruling by what people said, that they uh, hearsay, you see that people who are not educated mix up the two. The, the, the Beikase, the Uvlila, etc. Okay? Amar Rav Ashi. Now Rav Ashi tells us something very important in halacha. He said, Af anu nomar bavel bursif bursif bavel. Meaning, there is a place that's called bavel, Babylon. There is another uh, place that it's called Bursif. If uh, you look at the archaeological ancient map, you see that they, they, it was a huge change in the place that is called in the ancient time Bursif. And now, uh, later it turned to be Babylon. So because they mix the two, there are people who change around and use Bursif for Babylon and Babylon for Bursif, and they create a lot of problems. What is the problem? Lamedvav Amud Bet 36b, Lemay Nafka Mina. What's the difference when we're mixing the names? Legitei Nashim. The difference is when it's come to the issue of get. What's the issue of get? So, when the Bet Din writing a get, they have to make sure that everything is made kosher, which is. They have to write the name, the first name, the nickname, the last name of the person, the exact location, the details. And if you have an emissary, sometime unfortunately there is an issue, can be from hatred to a just a distancy, that they need to appoint the shaliach, an emissary, to send over the get from the bet din to the soon to be an ex, right? So therefore, <coughs> if it's a situation that they get the name of a person or his wife is inaccurate, it's considering a get pasul, an invalid get, and then the same halacha apply that if the name of the city is inaccurate, it's also make the get invalid. Okay? That's the halacha, uh, you see it in the Evan Ezer and, and much more. So, we have an issue that sometimes they're writing the name of the location that the name that people called it earlier. So in our uh, case, you have a situation that someone called the place Bursif and now Bursif it's called Bavel. So you have a get and someone wrote in the get Bursif. So here you have an issue. What do you do? So Rashi said here, the Kaimalan Bnei Bavel Bikiin Shetzarich Lichtov Get Lishma. We hold people in Babylon are erudite. And they knew that when you're writing a get, it has to be Lishma. If you remember, not long ago we discussed Hilchot Sefer Torah and we said that when you are um, fixing Sefer Torah or Tfilin or Mezuzah or anything like that you have to say Leshem Mitzvah for example Leshem Mitzvah Tfilin before you fixing a letter or something in a Tfilin the same with the Get you have to do it Leshem Mitzvah Leshem get mitzvah, mitzvah Get it's a Mitzvah from the Torah the writer to write a Get when it's a um, situation you need to so therefore if the people are not familiar and they write it. So for example, if you have someone who bring from outside of the land, like from Babylon, to the wife that she is dwelling in Earth Israel, you have to say which the Gemara called at the beginning of Gitting, Nechtav Nechtav Venechtav Befanav, which means there has to be at the present not only inscribing the get, but also sealed and signed at the uh, the front of the person in the bet din. Why? Because otherwise it may have a different intention. Such as, imagine if a man meant someone else. Can be, um, in those days, can be the second wife can be someone else. He meant something else. 
So by Alakha, if it doesn't mean specifically that woman, is the issue of validation of the get. Sometimes we say that the get is not valid if it's not intent to that person. How about if the other person has the same name as his wife or ex? It's an issue. So therefore, since people who are outside of Eretz Israel are not so familiar with Halakha, and because the people in Babylon are more familiar with that, so they didn't put it in writing. So therefore, if it's an emissary, if it's a shaliach, that he bringing a get from Babel to Eretz Israel, he does not need to say, Befanai nechtavu, Befanai nechtam. At the front of my face, I saw that he's in scribe and seal. Because imagine, again, the emissary, let's call him Abraham. He is taking the get from Babylon, and he is the emissary of the husband and the Bet Din, and he goes to Eretz Israel, and he appears before the wife, and he goes, and the Bet Din calls him and says, Wait a second, before you hand it over, tell us, did you are a witness to see all of that? So if it's someone who comes from Babylon, because people are so familiar, they do not ask the Shaliach to declare Befanai Nechtam or Befanai Nechtav Nechtam. In the front of my face, it's in the scribe and seal. So therefore, you need to know the exact location where it's coming from. So if you use the Babel, so we exempt them from that witness. But if you said Bursif, so it's an issue. Bursif, the people not familiar, can be issue of Befanai Nechtam, Befanai Nechtam. So what we understand here, so the issue of using a different words, either you go by the first or the second explanation, is crucial to validate a get. Because if it's not the correct location, if they mix the location or location change, and you wrote something that is not the correct location, the get is invalid. And therefore she's not considering as a divorcee. So now you see again implication of how we use it many terms here to show you how important it is to be scrupulous with everything. It's come to mixing between shofar and chatzotzra. You remember that? It's the kind of the difference between arava and tzafzafa in the law of Arba Taminim on Sukkot. Right? Then we have the issue of treifot, mixing between huvlila and beikasa. You remember? And now we have in Hilchot Gitin, mixing between the two words, between Bursif and Babel. You see four different locations that you just mix up one word and carry a very different meaning that can change around the whole situation of the Halakha. The Perak Shlishi, <coughs> we're about to begin the um, first Mishnah, and I would like to share with you some... Um, a word of introduction before we enter to that Mishnah. The first issue here, we study the Hatmana, a little bit the whole idea of taking out a ready-made food that has a certain temperature and pulling it out before Shabbat and wrapping it with a blanket in order to uh, preserve a certain temperature. There are two separate entities that we're going to discuss in this Mishnah and the following Mishnah. Naming, <coughs> if we intend to return it during Shabbat or before Shabbat. More actually in our days, to make it more accurate, Imagine if you have, which we call in our days, for example, a blech. You have a stove and you put something that cover the stove and then you put the pot. Then, before Shabbat, you're reaching a certain temperature and you're pulling it out for all kinds of reasons. The question is, can you bring it back? What's the problem? If you talk about real, for example, vegetables, if you leave them directly on the blech even, it's an issue that you are basically cooking it. But if you pull it out and if you put it on the ground, it changes the temperature. And now by putting it back, imagine if, for example, it's a freezing cold winter. You put it on the floor 
and then you put it back, it's a problem. Versus if you take it out and you just put it back the same way. Another issue needs to be solved is the issue <coughs> that you want to do it during Shabbat, which means you have something on the blech, or on the, um, whatever you heat it, can be Shabbat plata, and you're taking a little bit, something, before the meal, whatever the reason, can taste it, or whatever, you have a reason, and now, because of that, you're changing the status of the food. Why? Because again, you are enter the domain of, number one, maybe cooking, Number two, it's the issue of Hatmana. We explained before that Hatmana, as long as you're not adding more a smoke and Mosif Hevel, then it's fine to take it and wrap it as long as you keep the temperature the same way. However, if it's an issue that you made it in a way that it's add more um, a heat to the product and people usually like to eat a hot food, especially if it's a cold winter, on Shabbat, then you have the issue of doing this type of melacha. So we so far said in a very abbreviated way, we discussed several issues, such as hatmana, wrapping it at, for example, in order to observe it. We have a issue of a hagasha hadacha, to peel it out, to put it in, right, or some type of bishul cooking. There's another issue, you have its megis, if someone can open <clears throat> and while he opened it, he took out some of the food from the from the uh, from the uh, product. For example, chamin, uh, chont, uh, you call it, etc., etc. So the Mishnah said, and first let's go over the Mishnah and then go to a more explanations because there are two school of thought in this Mishnah. Kirashe sikua bekash uvigvava. If a a double stove, right? Uh, it was a special clay that uh, that opened in both ends, standing up on the stove or in the old days in, on the bricks, with fire beneath and room above the two parts. So, if a double stove were heated with a straw or a racking, which means, the, or, or stubble, or small bits of wood, it's collected in a field. Those of you who are in the service know that sometimes you need to extemporize something in order to make it hot. So they said, They may place on it a cooked food, which means on Friday you can put a cooked food to stay during the Shabbat. Now, but with peat or wood, one may not set, which means cook food on it, until he shall have racked it over, which means racked it out of the burning coal, or or she actually tenet a effer, or cover it with the ashes, the ashes on the top of the burning coal to um, deaden the fire so that although uh, if he forget about it, it's a, some type of forgetfulness, uh, one does not turn over the coal to complete the cooking because sometimes it's changing the chatebe gechalim in order to cook it. Beit Shammai Omrim, Beit Shammai said, Chamin avalot avshil, which means may, uh, one may place the water, but not cook food. Ubeit Hillel Omrim, chamin vetavshil, but the school of Hillel said <coughs> both hot water and cook food, both he can place on. Bet Shammai Omrim, notlin avalo machzirin. Bet Shammai said that you can take it, but you cannot put it back. Ubeit Hillel Omrim, af machzirim. And the school of Hillel said, you also made it put it back on Shabbat. So in other words, Beit Hillel all 
that you can even return it. By the way, halacha goes in general by by um, by Beit Shammai in that sense that if, for example, you take out a food from um, the um, whatever it's uh, the stove uh, and you pull it out and you put it on the floor, then and you save it, then it is the issue you cannot put it back. It's like, in a sense, reheated. Now, we need to go a little, um, another level with the Mishnah, because um, uh, <coughs> we need to understand a deeper the Mishnah in order to go further with the Gemara. Some order for introduction. We have a different category of food. If you remember, we studied earlier Ma'achal ben dosai, which is a certain food that have a certain level. It's called ben dosai, which is a food that was cooked and can be eaten. It's not the, the fully ready cooked food, but still is in a category that some people can eat it versus fully cooked food. And what happened is, sometimes by changing around the coal, you can change the status of the food to be a better cook or cook in a level that people can use it as a food. So here we discuss uh, two different entities. One it's called Hachzara, which means returning the item, and one is Lashot, that is a temporary situation. You still hold the pot, for example you're serving soup, but um, you didn't put it anywhere and you want to return it in that status. For those who just walk in, so I need to um, review a few words we uh, discussed in the Mishnah. Uh, in this parak, just a general statement and then we zoom in the Gemara and the Mishnah here. This parak is crucial for the whole concept of Shabbat because uh, there are, in a practical manner, there are several things that you can say, ah, I don't know how practical it is, but this parak has a lot of applications. The first subject we need to dig in and understand clearly is the subject of cooking. It's called in Hebrew, melechet bishul. Bishul meaning cooking something. Cooking can be in many different directions. We explained earlier today that if even you have a blech on the top of the stove, yet you take a fresh vegetable and you put it directly on the blech, you basically cooking on Shabbat, which is forbidden. So when it's come to bishul, to cooking, can be baking, can be uh, roasting, can be uh, some type of, um, like you take a um, scramble egg and you move it around, right? Mm. Dave, how you call it? Tigun. Um. You scramble an egg, oh, right? Yeah. So you're stirring it, right? Right. So what do you call that, that type of work? Oh, stirring? Oh, it's... Uh, it's some type of stirring. Anyway, that's mm. called tigun. All of mm. this forbidden on Shabbat. Now, when we zoom in, we see that, that the cooking involved in a lot of abbreviation of that indirect. For example, there is a concept in Halakha that it's called Toladat Ha'o. What is Toladat Ha'o? It's not necessarily by putting directly on a stove and product, can be a subsequent. Like, for example, you take a ready-made food that, um, that was taken away after you put it down, for example, in the freezing cold floor, and you put it back on a blech. Okay? While the temperature, meanwhile, changed. Forbidden, right? Or, for example, you take a, something that it's not fully cooked, and you put it in the big pot of, of, a, of hot water, and you put it back inside that pot. If you remember, when we discussed the definition, we talk about klirishon, klisheni, klishlishi, which means the first stage when it's direct, on the pot, the second is one 
part of the top of the other and then the third one it's all different level of gradation in the sense of making something as a cooking product now when it's come to cooking there are prohibitions a rabbinic prohibition that derive from that point which is one concept is called shehiya. What does that mean? Even we're not allowed to cook on Shabbat, we can take some product from the uh, uh, stove and uh, and put it. For example, you serve people and put it back directly right away on a blech, while the temperature did not change. Okay. Now, what about if something is not fully baked in advance, before Shabbat, but it's still early enough that the work will continue on on Shabbat? Such as, imagine if Gilbert take before Shabbat and prepare some potatoes, and Bruce help him, and he add some onion, and David help him, and he put some uh, other different mashed potatoes in between with uh, pieces of chicken or meat. And he mets um, all together, they make some type of hamin, some type of whatever you call it in Yiddish, chont, chun, chont, whatever. Chunt. You prepare all of that. Now you put it on the blech, but the problem is, it's now is a week that the time change and Shabbat is earlier and Bruce in a rush to start the minion earlier and everything is in a rush so you put it on the blech and guess what's going to happen it's going to cook while it's already Shabbat which means you start the process before Shabbat but it's carry on and continue cooking during Shabbat so what, what, what do you think so as far as the Torah is concerned you don't find a prohibition Rab rabbis have some issues such as one problem, it's called mechate bagechalim. You have the coral, for example, if you make the barbecue, you have under that the coral, and you start moving them around, right, in order to uplift it, the heat inside, so it's help. So the theory is that you come in from the synagogue an hour later, and you realize that the food is what? It's not fully ready. So what the next thing a person may do, if, for example, it's a barbecue, so you take the coral and start moving them around, which call mechate bagechalim, and therefore, we're afraid that he may do that, so therefore we say that it's, um, um, a person should not do this type of thing. Now we're going to see soon the difference between different stoves, different stages of stove, and that's one issue that it's called shehiya. Now, within Sheya, there is a concept that it's called Mitztamek Veralo or Mitztamek Veyafelo, which means sometimes the food that you put in, because of the extra heating, the food turned to be a shrinking the side. The heat that contained the food make the food smaller and smaller. Sometimes, while the food becomes smaller, it's good for the food, right? Sometimes it's not. So again, it's a different category in the type of food when it's the time will help the food to be better or not. So all of that is under the category which is called Shehiya, time in between. The second category we're going to study is the category of Chazara, which means when and how a person can return the um, pot back on the, um, for example, blech. According to the Torah, if you take something f that is fully baked from the stove, you can basically return it because there is a concept that is called Ein Bishul Achar Bishul. You cannot cook and recook and recook. Again, we speak here in general in a dry product um, um, but some said even that it's turned colder but if it's a a liquid is a different issue because in a liquid uh, basically you are 
creating a new situation, okay? But if you have something that is already fully cooked, it's called in Ivrit, Nidbashel Kol Tzorko, it's fully cooked, so by the Torah, if it was uh, re-cooked, it's not an issue because it's already cooked one. However, the Chachamim, the sages, have issue with that. They put a boundary here. Why? Because again, you remember we discussed Shema Yechate, that the person go and he see that it's too cold, so he start moving around the coral. So that's apply the so that's one fear. Another issue is Nir Ekemevashel. The the Talmud used the word Nichzei, which means it appear like he is cooking, and therefore someone who see it, he understand that okay if. If a religious man does that, so I am not so religious, I can do it too. And then he entered the domain of really violation of Shabbat. So, um, so far what we understand is just a general concept before we digging in the, the Gemara. The last concept I, I, I uh, would like to share with you today is the concept of Muktze, which you discussed earlier, but I want to elaborate one word or two of a mukze. Mukze meaning you take for example an item such as let's say if you have a plant in a house and that plant is basically um, a flower and it's immovable I mean you can move it from one location to another but in, uh, in general you don't move it it stays there so on Shabbat you have no reason to relocate that item therefore that item became mukze which means we are forbidden to move that item from one location to another on Shabbat. There is another concept within Muktze that it's called Migo de Itkatsai le Ben Hashmashot Itkatsai le Kule Yoma, which means since a person may appointed an item to be an item that it's Muktze, so uh, therefore that Muktze is carry on for the entire Shabbat. So just to to get all, all of that uh, together, there are different categories of Muktze. There is a Muktze that because it's forbidden, for example, we mentioned if you recall the, the candle, the minutes you light the candles, it's Muktze. You cannot take the candle uh, while it's in one location and relocate the candle on Shabbat to a different location. Okay, that's one category. It's called Muktze Mechamat Isu. It's forbidden. Another category, it's called Muktze Mechamat Mius, which means if you have, as an example, we use the, um, the porcelain candle, if you remember. So we discuss that, that whatever left over, it's, um, it's uh, something that you cannot use for the other purposes. A, pe a person disgusted whatever left over from the oil. So he trash it, he break it, he doesn't do anything. So therefore, since it's only one time use, okay, so you cannot use it for other purposes on Shabbat. And, and now we go to the second part, the Gemara, in order to understand the Mishnah. So in very general term, the Mishnah speaks about Kira, which is um, a stove that was um, lit on Shabbat, okay, but they lit it um, 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 in a way that it was in advance before Shabbat, but um, it's a huge uh, dispute between Rashi and everybody else what exactly happened, but uh, if that's something that um, in order to make Shehiyah, which means the food will stay there and then will be cooked, or um, he took it and he returned it, which is called Hazara. But anyway, in a simple manner, so we said that stove that was lit on Shabbat Eve with straw or with wrecking, so, so you, not tavshil, you can go ahead and put um, uh, um, on the top of that pot part before Shabbat in order for that staying long time and um, uh, fully finish the process um, um, on Shabbat. Alright? So now again, there is a huge difference between Rashi and everybody else. 
One said that it's the issue of keeping the temperature in a certain direction. Uh, it's just observing the heat in the, uh, the uh, that product. Others uh, hold that the problem is the same as we said earlier. Shema yechateba gechalim, that he take the coral and start moving them on Shabbat because it's not hot enough. Now, the, the other part of the Mishnah said that if it's involved with gefet, which is um, with, uh, you call it here, uh, a pomace, um, part that remain from the thin seeds, so he can go ahead and do it, but again, we divided here between two different items. One, when it's a grufa, grufa meaning that they take already the coal from the stove, or ktuma, ktuma meaning that it's, uh, he adds ashes to that. It's all in order to make, this is old time uh, stoves, but we can derive a lot of halachot to us. And here we enter to what we discussed earlier, the machloket between Beit Shammai and Beit Hillel. Beit Shammai hold that you can add um, uh, water, hot water, and, uh, but not a cook, something that is cooked. And Beit Hillel said that you can add both water or something that is cooked. Now we go to the Gemara. Uh, ah, and another thing I forgot uh, is the end of the Mishnah. The Beit Shammai said that uh, the minute you take something, uh, from the stove, you cannot return it, and Beit Hillel said that you can return it um, 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 even uh, even on Shabbat. Now we're going to um, discuss it in the Gemara. The Gemara said, "Ibayaleu, hi lo iten." When we said early in the Mishnah that the person should not put the the product, you meant to say "lo yachzir." Avalashot Mashin, you meant to say that he can he cannot take it but he can return it. So um, a part that he cooked off the fire and wishes to return on Shabbat. So you meant to say that to leave the part from Shabbat Eve into Shabbat, he may leave it even through the stove is not swept the coral. So he said Avalashot Tatafshil Mashin. Aval Pishen no Garuf and no Katum Umani. So even it's not covered with ashes. So who is the opinion that hold that? Hanania, he, this is according to Hanania. Why? Because Hanania said, the Tanya Hanania omer kol shehu ke ma'achal ben drosai mutar la shloto al gabe kira v'al pi sheno garu v'no katum. We explained earlier that it was a, a robber or famous thieves that they eat foods that was not fully cooked. But since that, we have understanding that there are certain category of level of cooking. There is a cook that is in a level of Mahal ben Drosai that it's sufficient to make it uh, eatable. It's not the best, but it's eatable. So because of that, um, um, uh, we have, um, we hold that ben Drosai is about one third of the level of cooking or the Rambam and Rivet said it a half of a level of cooking. So that apply during the time of cooking it. So for example, if you have a food that enough for that food to be um, on the stove for two hours. So one third, it means 40 minutes, right? Mm -hmm. So the time that you measure the cooking with the water it's from the moment that you touch it and it's too hot. It's called Yad Soledad Bo, which means the minute you put your hand, it's already very hot. Um, so you don't count, the Chazonish said, you don't count the time that you turn it on and prepare it, only from the time that it's really hot, cannot touch it. But anyway, we said here, Hananiah Hall, that as long as the, any food that was already been cooked to the extent of the food of Ben Drosai, who would cook his food the minimum amount necessary. So he said, one is permitted to leave a top of the stove on Shabbat even though the stove is not swept and not covered with ashes. That's way 
one way to understand it. Or Dilma, or maybe you said differently, that when the Mishnah said Lo Yiten, you should not bring it Lash Hot Tnan, which means the, this uh, speak about leave it on the fire from Shabbat Eve. I garuf vekatum ein I lo lo vekol sheken lachzir. And if the coals so in the stove were swept or covered with the ashes, we understand it fine. So one may leave it the pot on the stove. But if not, so one may not leave. And for sure, the kol sheken for sure, one may not return to the stove on Shabbat at any circumstances. So you see here, lo yiten, meaning in advance, mi be'od yom, before, which means shehiya, which means in between. So even Hanania hold that this type of food that doesn't reach the point of ma'achal ben drusai, he cannot delay it. So you understand from that that when you use the term cook food in a Mishnah, it means that anything that has the minimum of ben drosai, which again means either one third or a half. So, in short, what the Gemara asks here, all this limitation the Mishnah speaks about in conjunction to return the food, and that's the point of Hananiah, that, it's, um, that the food is at least have the value of Ma'achal ben drosai, which is one third, or it's all discussed in Shehiya and how long you can delay it. So, Tashma. So they bring another Brisa to understand it, to understand this dilemma. Midiktani trei bavei bematnitin Because the Mishnah divided to two parts in the machloket, in disputation between Hillel and Shammai. Number one, Bet Shammai omrim chamin avalo tavshil u betel omrim chamid vetavshil. Bet Shammai said that you can put uh, hot water on the stove, but not the cooked food. And Bet Hillel said, regardless, both you can put. The second one, Bet Shammai urim notlim avalo machzirim. Bet Shammai said that you can eat from this stove on Shabbat, but you cannot return it to the stove. Mm-hmm. And Bet Hillel said, mm-hmm. even you can return it. So if Amar Bishlama lash hot nan, if you talk about delay it, which means before you put it on the kira. So it's fine. So we understand the Hachiktani, Kira Shi Sikua Bekasu Bigvava. So we understand the Mishnah as follows. A stove that was lit with straw or with reckoning. So what happened, Mashina Leatav Shil, so you can, one may leave a cook food on it. And then he said, in advance, before, the, before Shabbat. Oh, Achi ten, Begefet um, Ubeetzin, Lo Yashe, Achi Grof, Achi ten Efer. With a promise or with wood, one may not leave the cook food until he sweep the coals out while it's still there or until he place the ashes on it. So we elaborate and say, and we said, my machine, what exactly we leave? Bet Shammai omrim chamin avalo tafshil. Bet Shammai hold that hot water but not cook food. Bet Elel omrim chamin vetavshil. Bet Elel said that regardless, one may leave both hot water and cook food on it. And when is it just disagree with regard to leaving a pot on the stove, what does that mean? Which means according to Beit Shammai, it's Chamin, and according to Beit Hillel, Chamin Vetavshil. But the Marsha Ed to the Etrashin, he said, but for example, something that is forbidden, for example, a cooked food according to Beit Shammai, so you cannot bring it back on Shabbat, and that's obvious. That's given. Next, Shabbat Shammai umrim not klim avalo machzirim vetel umrim av machzirim. Which means that the Beit Shammai hold that, that one may take the pot from the stove on Shabbat, but not return it to the stove at all. And Beit Hillel said, no, you can return it. But if you say that the first part of the Mishnah, that it means that you return the cooked food, here is the way you have to explain the Mishnah. 
כי רש"י איש סיכו הרבה כעס וגובה מחזירים עליה בתבשיר If you could get, they can return that, something that was there before Shabbat and you just took it before Shabbat בגפד ובעצים לא יחזיר עד שיגרוף עד שייתן אפר The other way you can return only if you add ashes right? But as long as the condition is that he has to be cooked at least one third the way of Mahal ben Rosai. ומה הם מחזירים? And what type of food will allow to return on Shabbat? בית שמה אומרים חמין אבל לא תבשיל. ובית אלה אומרים חמין ותבשיל. Which means, um, according to this uh, point, בית שמה allow to return uh, something that is גרוף או כתום, something that is a, 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 a ready food. Because the additional of cooking, it doesn't change it. It's not look like he's cooking on Shabbat. And then, Beit Shema אומרים חמיר, לא ותבשיר, בין אומרים חמיר ותבשיל. How? Beit Shema אומרים נוטלים אבל לא מחזירים. The last part of the Mishnah. So Beit Shema said נוטלים, you can take, but not return it. But לא אומרים אף מחזירים. So it means that Beit Shema intent is only to forbid return this type of ready product to, back to the store. Because they agree that if it's already cooked, you are allowed to return it. So here Beit Hilali meant to say that he allowed to return this ready product. So they ask a question, Hat tu lama li? So why the Mishnah need to mention this second one? Be, because it looks like you repeat what you said earlier. So the only explanation to understand it is that the first part of Mishnah speaks about taking any ready product that it was before Shabbat and you are basically mashhed, you're basically talking it uh, uh, but, but because the Mishnah required the roof of Katum, the Mishnah required that it's already made so you can't say that it's all by Hananiah so in short what we're saying before we go to practical halacha if you're taking something that's already cooked and it's staying on a stove and you serve and you return it to the blech so far we understand that it's fine פרקטיקל הלכה, so first, שולחן אורך הלכה עם פי אוהד, טלטול שופר וחצוצרה, we discuss about carrying, moving a shofar or a trumpet, so we said sound of a shofar or a trumpet is uh, prohibited on Shabbat, so since the, uh, the ruling with regards to a set aside is, a, is a, the way that we uh, explain Rabbi Shimon's opinion, so one may move Um, trumpet or, or shofar uh, to utilize them for a permanent use or to utilize their place. So in other words, if they use the shofar to tell people that Shabbat is coming, then he can put it in a certain location or he can remove it as long as they need it for the, that purpose. But the minutes that it became a muktzeh, then he cannot move them. Another important halacha we learn about kira, she sikua begefet ubetzim. This is the Rambam. Hilchot Shabbat chapter 3, he said, Before Shabbat it is prohibited to place a pot with food that could benefit from additional cooking on the stove that was lit with wood or, or, or sesame seed pulp or olive peat pulp. One may, not, may do so if the coals were swept or the coals were covered with ashes. This is according to Beit and Hanania. Some commentary explains it's like the Rema that it is permitted to place a pot on any stove even if it were lit uh, with wood or, or any coal that were neither swept nor covered with ashes before Shabbat as long as the food was cooked to the extent of the food of Ben Rosai which is either one third or you said a half cooked um, the, according to Rambam and Raivet it's a half cooked or uh, according to some one third cooked that's the Mishnah Brura that as long as they have some type of level of cooking it's um, you can do that boyachem le shuloim alachai shuloim alachai Shulo.